Okay, hi, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'll start, get right into the topic, a very unusual man. I think the topic, the ultimate uh, bulldozer is the correct term. By the way, there is a handout um, that Ari sent to you. Um, you might want to read it. It's a, it's a very readable uh, little piece there about uh, perspect certain perspectives on Sharon, which I will be covering in more detail uh, today. So Arik Sharon, there are a lot of books about him, tremendous amount of books. Most of them are people who absolutely love him so much that you can hardly imagine it. This is the one good book that came out in 2014. If any of you really want to get into some of the background material, which I haven't got time to do at uh, this stage, this is the book, David Landau, an excellent uh, newspaper man, journalist, and a highly sophisticated writer. So Arik Sharon uh, starts off in the Haganah. It's one of the four underground groups. And the first thing we find about Arik Sharon, which is going to come up a lot this whole, uh, during the whole session, he doesn't always tell the truth. And uh, he said that he had absolutely no connection with uh, the Saison. The Saison was a very complex event where two leftist underground groups and two rightist underground groups were fighting each other before the creation of the state. And uh, Arik Sharon, who was then in the Haganah, maintained that he had never had any uh, conflict with the right-wing group. Mordechai Tsipori, a uh, respected uh, member of the Likud, said exactly the opposite. This comment that I'm making now will come up again and again. Arik Sharon uh, has the start of a very tough military career in Latrun, the Battle of Latrun. 1948, one of the famous battles, um, one of the most difficult battles because it was fought not only by Israeli soldiers, but by Holocaust survivors who'd in some cases been in Israel for two weeks, picked up a little bit of uh, language and that was all. In this particular uh, battle, uh, Arik Sharon was the platoon commander and 15 of the 35 people in his unit were killed. By the way, Arik Sharon has been close to death most of his life in the military and in non-military realms. Uh, and in this particular case, at the age of 20, he actually said he had no friends. All his friends had actually been killed. This is really the, the basis of this uh, man we're speaking about. Um, a very important political figure, and at the same time, I think a, a very tragic figure. Uh, after a few years, he got into this unit, the 101, uh, which was an elite uh, unit with parachutist people in. And Arik Sharon uh, did something which was uh, very unpopular in the world. He attacked a village, killing 69 people, many of them uh, women and children. And uh, Ben-Gurion's comment, I think, is uh, very, very uh, significant. Uh, as you can see there, uh, not to worry about the world. The important thing is how it will be looked at here in this region. This is going to give us the possibility of living here. This is Israel in the 1950s, a different country from what it is today. Very harsh, actually. Uh, um, a very uh, a military. And by the way, for the Jewish people, this was pretty much a new experience. Jews haven't been involved in military affairs, by and large, uh, through history. And here, Israel was such an unbelievably military kind of situation. I think it was very hard for people living out of Israel and, and also for many Jews to realize just how central the military was uh, in Israeli society. Now, Arik Sharon, who had by and large poor relationships with people, had excellent relationships with uh, David Ben-Gurion. But Ben-Gurion liked him. He was, uh, both of these people were down to earth, uh, Ben-Gurion was much more intellectual than Sharon, but we can even see in this casual picture of Arik Sharon sort of leaning over to Ben-Gurion, who was at that time already called the old man, close relationship, which was very important, where people were disagreeing with Sharon. Uh, Sharon always had the ability to have open access to the prime minister, uh, David Ben-Gurion. This has been a strong point. He always had one or two friends around, not too many, uh, but uh, in this particular case, Ben-Gurion being a close friend really got his career getting off the ground. 1956 campaign, we uh, begin to see some of the uh, difficulties. 
Um, Motagur, a very famous Israeli general, uh, was one of the many people who had uh, conflict with uh, uh, Arik Sharon. And his comment here uh, that Sharon didn't direct the battle, he panicked presumably because he acted against orders. Uh, this really was something um, which we have to remember. And Dayan's comment that maybe there's no room for Arik Sharon uh, becomes an ongoing question within the Israeli military. We could probably get, uh, speak to, we could have spoken in the past, to about 20 uh, central officers in the Israeli army who would have said something similar to Sharon. Sharon is essentially someone who does not believe in listening to other people. That's a trait which he has right through his life. Uh, and you can understand that in the military, which is a hierarchical framework, to have a junior officer, or as time went by, he became a senior officer, constantly disobeying orders, put the uh, Israeli army in an impossible situation. But as we're going to see, uh, Arik Sharon became popular with the people. He was a people's man, and much less popular with uh, the elites of Israeli society. This is a picture of 1956 when Diane. Uh, who's sitting, standing next to Arik Sharon there. Arik Sharon's on the left. Uh, these were interesting uh, crowd of people. Many of these people who were successful in the Sinai campaign of 1956 carried on in the army and became the uh, major generals. By the way, just a comment about the Israeli army, very different from the American army by virtue of the fact that the army tries to get people out of the army at a young age. So they actually go into another career. There's only a handful of people who actually kept in for a long time. And this really made the Israeli army always a, an army that could deal with change. Young people tend to change more easily than older people. And uh, those who carried on for a long time, like Diane and Sharon and people like that, they were pretty much the exception. Here, in, uh, uh, he married um, uh, his wife, Gali, some years earlier, uh, nine years earlier, but she was killed in a car accident. And then Lily, who was Gali's sister, had been the babysitter of their young child, Gur. Let me just go jump forward a little bit because Sharon, in terms of a family life, uh, faced uh, uh, three crises, which we'll hear a about, bit about more later. Firstly, Gully, who had been married to for nine years or so, she was killed in an accident. Lily died quite a few years before Arik Sharon did. And the tragedy of tragedies is that a young boy, Gur, their first child, uh, was, was at home, uh, at the Sharon home. And uh, for some reason or other, there was a, lo a loaded uh, shotgun. And a friend picked up the shotgun, a friend of Gur, and shot and killed Gur. So here we have a situation where two of his wives and the a young son Gur were all uh, killed. And I think it's been this which, which made Sharon a hard person. Uh, he was never, never pliable. He, he was respected uh, by the masses, but he was a harsh kind of human being. And I'm sure those kind of family events had a big effect on him. In the Six Day War, once again, same situation. Uh, to use that common expression, cockshawed, even how he's standing, it shows he's already pretty high up in the military in 1967. Once again, his armored brigade uh, broke through the Egyptian positions, but once again, it brought about a total disagreement with the military elite. There's consistency with uh, Sharon, uh, and he, he is someone who never leaves the scene. It's very interesting. He annoys people, but he's always there. He was totally in the Israeli arena for absolute uh, years. Sharon's relationship with Yitzhak Rabin was interesting. Rabin, at an earlier stage, had uh, pretty much felt that uh, Sharon really couldn't be relied on. And it was decided, by the way, uh, many years before Sharon got to the top, that he would never be suitable uh, to be the chief of staff. But there was something interesting about them, but it soured. 
we'll see this a little later. Uh, Sharon, who was a Likud person, Sharon was always very much on the right wing. Uh, uh, Rabin was a Labour Party person. Even with their political differences, which are very harsh in Israel, as in most other countries, uh, managed to get on well with each other. Once again, I mentioned it earlier, Sharon always had a few allies around, a few patrons, and that I think kept him within the arena for much of the period. The Yom Kippur War was uh, Sharon's great success. This was uh, uh, an unbelievable reality. And this picture is, is very important. Sharon was in the middle of a battle and his, he was injured. And so most people in that situation and the medical people wanted him to leave the battleground. Sharon wouldn't. And this picture has uh, permeated Israeli society. If you would ask many Israelis, uh, what picture can you remember about Sharon? It's essentially this picture. The unusual phenomenon of what we see here is Diane, who smiled in this picture, didn't smile for the rest. Uh, as I mentioned in last week's session, together with Golda Meir, they had made a number of serious mistakes. Uh, poor planning. Diane himself had totally panicked, and he had spoken about the destruction of the Third Temple. Uh, Arik Sharon, in that situation where it seemed that the political and military leadership were failing, he became the hero. And the expression, Arik, King of Israel, Arik, Melech Yisrael, used to permeate in the marketplaces of Israeli society. He would go into the shuk, into the marketplace, and for years later, uh, everyone around would be absolutely uh, delighted with him. Uh, he had charisma. There's no doubt about it. Arik Sharon had charisma. And I think being an anti-establishment person played in his favor. He was never, even when he was in the establishment, he was perceived as an anti-establishment uh, person. Well, not only was he involved in the army, but he was very much involved in Gushimunim. He became the patron of Gushimunim. The Gushimunim, for those of you who don't know this organization, is the largest and most successful non-political uh, NGO that has ever existed in Israel. After the Six-Day War, a significant number of people in Israel decided that the real Israel is the Israel of the territories, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, uh, and uh, that is really the biblical homeland of the Jewish people, not Sin City like Tel Aviv and the coastal plain. Uh, and this has uh, permeated uh, uh, Israeli society. Uh, many of the people in Gushim uh, were and are religious. And Arik Sharon, uh, quite soon after 1967 and certainly after 1973, believed that the land had to be taken, the land had to be conquered. And uh, he was unimpressed with politicians who were negotiating uh, with various leaders in the world. And he therefore seriously became uh, the patron of Gushimunim and a tremendous amount of the settlements, some it's often in the, the news, uh, the settlers in the West Bank, um, the tremendous amount of the settlements, the uh, outposts that were established, were established by Arik Sharon, in most cases illegally, quite honestly. It, often it wasn't with uh, direct government assistance, it was certainly not with global support, but Arik Sharon, this one-man show, uh, did what he wanted. And then you can see a, a very significant uh, amount of people would turn up at all the Gushimonim uh, activities. Uh, Gushimonim, by the way, in Hebrew, in English, it's uh, the block of the faithful, the block of the people who believe in the Almighty, the people who believe in the holy words of the Bible. The Bible is not some theoretical work in their minds, but it's the real uh, desire of the Almighty. These are people who really do regard the Jewish people as God's children. And therefore, the land is not just land, but it's holy land. And Arik Sharon, who himself, not a religious person, by the way, nothing about religiosity ever covered, it came into his life, uh, received the support of large sections of uh, deeply orthodox people. In 1979, uh, the peace treaty was signed with Egypt. 
Now, but one part of it, one of the clauses of the peace treaty uh, was that after a few years, Sinai would be returned to Egypt. This was the peace treaty signed by Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, a major, major event in Israeli history, because this was a right-wing leader, uh, Menachem Begin, giving back land. Arik Sharon was brought in, and you can see he was brought in as defense minister two years after the treaty. And when Menachem Begin brought Arik Sharon in as a minister of uh, defense, people asked the question, why are they doing it? The reason is a, a harsh reason, and one has to be honest. It's really because uh, Arik Sharon was ruthless. He'd been ruthless all the time. And until now, he had been ruthless against uh, Arabs and Palestinians. Now was the time to be ruthless against uh, the Jewish settlers. And the picture which you see over here was a very, very dramatic moment of Israeli history where the soldiers, as you can see in the front, are climbing up the ladder and the uh, mainly religious uh, youngsters on the roof. And there was a, a battle between uh, settlers and uh, right-wing Israel people who lived within great in within the Green Line Israel and the soldiers. I mean, this was looked terrible at that time, and uh, um, this really seemed to be what was about. Begin believed that no one else could do it. No one else would have the guts, certainly from a right wing perspective, to bring the soldiers to move the people out of Yamit. What happened in Yamit, by the way, and this was Sharon's decision, that there were some beautiful houses. So as a kind of uh, uh, a weapon against the Egyptians, Sharon decided to bulldoze the houses. Once again, the concept of the bulldozer. And so when the Egyptians eventually got the whole of Sinai, the city of Yamit, which was lovely, I, I was there, uh, there was nothing left but just uh, ruins. The Lebanon War starts a downfall of uh, not only Menachem Begin, but Arik Sharon. 1982 Lebanon War, the operation for a piece of Galilee, was filled once again with uh, Arik Sharon taking advantage of Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin was an astute politician and a very legalistic person, by the way, uh, in Israel is constantly mentioned today that uh, Begin would only work uh, in tandem with the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, Menachem Begin was not a military person. And uh, he was taken on a tour of the northern part of Israel and into southern uh, Lebanon. And, and the building that you can see there is the Crusader Fort. Uh, he was brought to the Crusader Fort. And uh, Arik Sharon was trying to explain to Menachem Begin where north is. And Begin had absolutely no idea of where he is. And so there's a picture of him looking south rather than north. Begin had been told by Sharon uh, that uh, this venture, which eventually became a, a long, long war, uh, well into the mid 80s, um, that uh, there, there was, it was, as a short, it was a campaign. It wouldn't be a war. And in the discussion in the cabinet, where the ministers were trying to get correct information from uh, the defense minister, Arik Sharon, he said, don't worry, it's a little, it's a, a campaign. Uh, in 24 hours, we're going up to 40 kilometers, and that, that's what it is. The truth of the story is that Arik Sharon intended to get to Beirut, which is far up on the north, far up on the north, uh, and um, the, uh, uh, the idea was, that he claimed that it wasn't Beirut, and it was near Beirut, but not in Beirut. Uh, sorry, there's a spelling mistake there. But, uh, but that was wrong. It was already in the uh, city of uh, Beirut, the, um, which is a very large city. So it was pretty clear that the Israeli soldiers were inside. And Menachem Begin then realized that he, he was prime minister, but he was receiving totally incorrect information from Arik Sharon. That was bad enough, but the crisis of that particular war was this picture. Uh, September 1982, Sabran Chatila. Sabran Chatila was a situation where the Christian phalanges uh, 
uh, who were in conflict with the local Muslims went into these two camps, Sabra and Shatila, and wiped the, the population out. Very, very brutal. There was a commission of inquiry, the Khan report, very, very interesting report, by the way. Uh, after every major event in Israel, there's a commission of inquiry. And for someone like myself, a historian, uh, I always read them in detail because they're uh, objective, that's always an objective analysis of what happened in uh, uh, tough situations, not only in war, but in other, other situations. By the way, I remember this event personally because I was in Lebanon at that time. I was a communications person. And as the Sh Sabra and Shatila uh, killings were going on, those of us in communications, we were listening to the reports of what was going on. It was horrendous. Initially, the government denied it, but many of us were well aware that this was an unbelievable event. And the Khan report came out with the decision that under no conditions should, could Sharon be defense minister again. By the way, the report thought, the, the three writers of the report, imagined that this was the end of Arik Sharon uh, because of what he had been indirectly responsible for. The report says Sharon was not directly responsible, but because Israel was in control of that area in Lebanon, they should have been able to stop the Christian phalangists, a allies of Israel, from carrying out uh, this massacre. The report ignored the fact that at a later time, Arik Sharon would become prime minister, thinking that this was the end of him. It just meant that he couldn't be foreign, uh, prime, uh, couldn't be defense minister, but he would take on many other positions within the government uh, as the years went by. November 1949, uh, Rabin's assassination. But obviously uh, what I'm doing in a session like this is trying to take the dramatic events. In between, Sharon was very active in politics. He had strengthened himself. He had in fact built the Likud party, uh, uh, largely by joining three other factions. In November the 4th, uh, 1995, I think the most tragic moment of Israeli history. I've been in Israel 53 years. Uh, through uh, good and bad days. Uh, I, I imagine that this might have been the, the saddest day. For me personally, it was. Uh, it was a, a, a young law student uh, from Bar Ilan University uh, who decided to assassinate the prime minister because at that time, the major discussion in Israel was the Oslo Accord, the attempt uh, by Shimon Peres, who I'll be speaking about next week, uh, Yitzhak Rabin and uh, um, uh, Yasser Arafat to come to some sort of an agreement, which hasn't been an easy process. Anyway, there were those people, uh, not an, a small number of Israelis who were totally against it. And there was verbal violence in Israel, which I've never seen before or after. Uh, very, very angry comments, tremendous threats, comments by some rabbis that uh, if one took an action against the people who were prepared to give up holy land, like Rabin was, uh, then it was permissible to kill that person, that the person who did the killing would not be blamed uh, for a criminal act. It was very, very problematic. And when uh, Rabin was assassinated, uh, initially, Arik Sharon said he, he seemed to be very upset about it because, was, as we saw earlier, uh, Sharon and uh, Rabin had been allies. Dalia Rabin, uh, Rabin's daughter, very much respected in Israeli society. Uh, she, by the way, and her granddaughter are well known in Israel. Her granddaughter made an amazing speech at Rabin's funeral and much remembered for that. But uh, what Dalia Rabin said when Arik was so upset that his good friend and protege had been killed, uh, Dalia made a comment, which I think is a, a valid comment from her perspective. And uh, she said, as you can see, that he incited no less than Bibi. Harsh, harsh events, unfortunately, of Israeli history. March 2000, Lily died after a long illness. And here starts yet another stage in 
Sharon's life. Um, he, until now, uh, has been very much the military person. Uh, Lily's death seemed to have affected him tremendously. He uh, was very much in love with her, they had a wonderful relationship, and uh, she was living on the farm. The Sharons have a very large farm uh, in the southern part of Israel, and rather than staying over at night in Jerusalem for an extended period of time, he was going back by helicopter in many cases, uh, back to the farm uh, as much as anything to be uh, with, Eli, with, with Lily. Sorry. I think this is the turning point of Sharon, something that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes in more detail. But at the same time, Sharon is still uh, aggressive. September 2000, he goes up to Temple Mount, uh, where the Palestinians and Arabs generally were convinced that he was going up to change the status quo. Topic for another lecture, but the, the Temple Mount has essentially been under Jordanian control. The Waqf, the religious authority on the Temple Mount, are uh, pretty much beholden to Jordan. There's, from the Arab uh, Muslim perspective, there's been a, a fear for many, many years that Israel is going to take over the Temple Mount, which has the, uh, the, the, the two mosques. Uh, from a religious Israeli perspective, that's uh, the Holy of the Holies. There's nothing is more important. So the, the area of the Temple Mount is the most political area probably in the world. Probably no part of the world has more controversy than the, the Temple Mount. So when Arik Sharon went up there, it wasn't just going up there. It had implications. And that brought about the second intifada, the second uh, outbreak of uh, uh, violent Palestinian attacks, suicide bombings, uh, a period of uh, great insecurity in Israeli society. And here you see, for example, a uh, bomb, uh, a bus having been uh, bombed. In a strange situation, this man who one can almost see as being marginalized becomes prime minister. Uh, he had been around for so long, he'd been so central, he had had many ministerial positions that the Likud party realized that he was just about the only one who was able to take over uh, the country in the situation of insecurity. This whole idea uh, that we often hear in politics, when things are bad, you need someone with experience. And Arik Sharon was the, without doubt, the per per person with most experience, both political experience and military experience. And here we're seeing uh, meeting uh, Putin, who came uh, on a visit. And um, that's not going to end with the meeting with Putin. The attacks continue. One of the uh, worst ones was the Pesach attack, the Passover attack at the Park Hotel in Netanya. Uh, where 30 people were killed and 160 were injured. The picture shows you the inside of the dining room where they were having the uh, Passover Seder. Uh, and it seemed that uh, things were uh, not going the right way. In August 2002, out of the blue, Sharon starts talking about a Palestinian state. And why? Well, I must tell you, there's been more written about that. When people write about Sharon, it's the why that's always the question. Did he believe, as could well be, that uh, violence was not going to end, that the Palestinians were not going to give up? Was he very depressed with uh, uh, Lily's death? People say, who worked closely with him, uh, that he was in a depressed stage. He was prime minister, he reached the top of the totem pole, top of the political elite, and yet he wasn't happy, but watch the contradictions. He speaks, talk, he starts talking about the Palestinian state. People don't understand what's going on. This isn't, can't be Sharon. Sharon is the great right winger, the person who's gonna hold territory. Then in the January 2003 election, he goes against it. He says something totally different. He says, we're going to op oppose a, a disengagement from Gaza. And he makes a very important comment. 
the settlements in Gaza are equal to Tel Aviv. That means how can you give back Tel Aviv? How can you give back Gaza? Three months later, he signs the roadmap with the Americans, Russians, the European Union representatives and the United Nations. And he makes the comment that it is not right for Israel to rule over three and a half million Palestinians. Note the contradiction. It's totally different comments said within a period of three months. The right wing begins to be very, very upset, very worried that he's changing his perspective, that what he said in the election had no validity at all. And there starts a, the left, which had been fairly quiet until then, starts to demonstrate 150,000 demonstrators in Israel. Is a, that's a big number. That's a large number in Rabin Square, which has become the center of, 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 of uh, demonstrations. Um, and the, the peace camp begins to become much more active and believes that with Sharon, the right wing leader, it is possible uh, to uh, give up the territories, which was part of the uh, peace concept. Within a short period of time, and the, di the distance of the three years were years of unclear situations. Sharon did not have the parliament on his side. There were votes in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament, where he was defeated. And it, it seemed that he couldn't do it. That means that for the second time in Israeli history, the ruling party did not have the support, the support of the party. That, by the way, was exactly the same with Menachem Begin and the peace treaty with Egypt. We have a similar situation here. And as time goes by, slowly but surely, the number of people who realize that Sharon is serious, and he might be able to bring it about, does it. This is the, one of the massive demonstrations Tens of thousands of people, largely religious, but not only, went into mass demonstrations in the, in the south of the country. Things were getting violent. People spoke about the possibility of a civil war. At this stage, there were 20,000 soldiers. You can see all the red caps, uh, the orange caps, sorry, the orange caps are, are the sign of the demonstrators and every now and again, uh, you can see some military uh, um, people around. The number of soldiers eventually involved was 40,000. A massive, massive event, which had within it what uh, caused uh, deep psychological problems, situations where soldiers, young soldiers, 18 and 19 year old people, um, and not police, by the way, these are soldiers who had to uh, uh, remove the settlers. In the Gaza area, there were 7,500 Jewish settlers, and some of them left willingly, and many of them uh, didn't. So you have pictures like this, and pictures of soldiers going into the synagogue and uh, dragging people out. Uh, not, not, a, not nice, not, not comfortable scenes, and as I say, a period of tremendous fear. August 2005, the public opinion polls are clear. The majority of Israelis are clearly at this time in favor of disengagement, of leave, clearly that the decision to leave Gaza was accepted, but there was a third of the population who constantly feared that bloodshed uh, would be, uh, would, people would be killed. What influenced the uh, right wing camp were the statements of these two well-respected uh, chief, former chief rabbis, who said, God will not allow it to happen. By the way, the role of the Almighty in Israeli society is quite profound. Uh, it seems that so, quite often that God doesn't quite agree with the people who make the comments. And here Sharon makes a comment, which is a left of center comment. Uh, we cannot have a Jewish democratic state and continue to rule over the whole of Israel. This was at this stage, September 2005, the moment when, when Arik Sharon um, moved to the idea of unilateral declaration. By the way, this was not an agreement with the Palestinians. This was not an agreement with any uh, Arab country. This was a unilateral declaration, which when push comes to shove, uh, is probably not always such a sensible uh, political decision. 
one wants to make decisions with the agreement between two sides, not only the action uh, of, uh, of one side. November 2005, Arik Sharon leaves his own party. Um, we have some strange political activities in this country. People move in and out of parties. We found it recently uh, in Israel. He here leaves the Likud party and he creates the, creates the Kadima party. The Kadima party is the Hebrew for forward. Here he's got Tsipi Livni, who also had been a right winger and moved into the center. Uh, Shimon Peres, by the way, an old member of the Labour Party, left the Labour Party and joined the Kadima. This was a centrist party uh, which hoped to become a central player in Israeli society. It didn't. It was a, a short-term party. And uh, here they um, come together, November 2005. It looks as if everything is going to be okay. For the people on the center left and uh, defined left, this was a very important moment. Gaza had been given up. Certain West Bank settlements had been given up. Sharon was talking about giving up the whole of the West Bank. And this was going to be a very dramatic, at the same time, controversial event. However, what happened to an, a heavily overweight man, someone who we saw with, as in the Haganah, a youngster of 20, thin, very physical person, by the way, as time went by, he had um, become extremely overweight. He was an absolutely gigantic person, and this was going to have this uh, effect. January 2006, a massive stroke. And not only was it a massive stroke, and we can see, I think it's just a, an amazing, amazing picture, the look on his face, um, leads Israel into a long waiting period because he died only after eight years. He was in a coma. His body was initially taken from a hospital down to the family farm where they had medical staff and he was kept in a total coma. By the way, every now and again, one of his two sons would say, uh, Eric, the father has moved, his hands moved or something like that. But uh, that didn't seem to be uh, what it was all about. Let's conclude not with this picture, which would be a tough one to end with, but let's end with an analytical analysis which appears here. In April 2018, Haaretz, which is a left of center newspaper, uh, turned to a group of uh, people very, very much involved in all sections of Israeli society academics, people in political positions, senior civil servants, a um, whole range of good people. By the way, I, to be honest, I'm very, very impressed with the poll, knowing many of the people who were asked a set of questions. And they divided the questionnaire into various categories. And uh, tw we have had 12 prime ministers, including the 12th, who is uh, Bibi Netanyahu, uh, and they asked the questions, and we can see the answers here. In terms of courage, Arik Sharon, the, the, hot, the top is 10, obviously. 8.8, .8, second highest after Ben-Gurion. Charisma, third highest, 8.7, very, very high rating. Security, the fourth highest. Some people thought you'd get higher. And vision, the fifth highest. These are good ones. These are high. Look at the low scores social affairs, kept promises. It's so, so low. I didn't put the figures down. Honesty, very, very low, which means the, uh, this, this group of people who were asked questions, this guy decided that he was totally on, uh, dishonest. And he, his over, overall score was 7.3, which made him essentially six, number six. So in terms of this group of experts, who, as I say, it's not a regular poll, but a, a viewpoint of well-connected people uh, in the big picture of Israeli society. Uh, Sharon is nowhere near the worst, but at the same time, nowhere near the best. To conclude, a complex man, 
a belligerent person, in some cases violent, but for whatever reason, and as I said, there have been many different suggestions as time goes by, uh, at some stage, he decided that the, what had been so central to him, force, fighting, uh, military activity as the only solution, moved away from military concepts to uh, negotiation or trying to negotiate. Uh, he didn't really negotiate with the Palestinians, but he certainly moved from a military to a political approach. We will never know, as I'm sure some of you might ask, what would have happened if he had been alive. We never know 100%, although the historians who have studied him in most cases, and David Landau in particular, believe that the process of the disengagement would probably have continued. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to questions.